Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. I'm your host, Michael. Uh, joining me this week with Live from California, Gail Falkenthal of Communities Digital News. Uh, li- joining, me live, joining us live from the UK, the one and only Mr. Boxing Addict. Uh, what's going on, lady and gents? How you doing? It's, uh, it's, it's been a little bit of a rest week for us. Uh, it's a bye week in boxing. Yeah, all very good over here. Yeah, absolutely. Normally, uh, my normal comrade, Sean Newton. Uh, Sean won't be with us tonight. Uh, for for those who know, he teaches and he had to go to school. He had to attend to that, so he will not be joining us tonight. For those who are new to the Pound for Pound Boxing Report, Pound for Pound Boxing Report is a live YouTube show slash podcast slash blog that discusses all things boxing. Uh, the bottom, yeah. the motto of the show, excuse me, is when boxing is good, we'll talk about it. When boxing is bad, we will talk about it. The bottom line is, if you're concerned boxing, we will talk about it. If you want to find out information about the Pound for Pound Box Report, uh, go to the blog page, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. And repeat that, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com, where you will find articles and fight uploads and videos done by yours truly, as well as uh, special articles, articles written by uh, K- Kayla M. Lewis on Twitter, KBC Live on YouTube, as well as an article coming soon about uh, regarding Mayweather and Pacquiao from one Gail Falkenthal herself. Um, if you also check the Pound for Pound Box Report blog page on the right, uh, we'll provide links to where to find the Pound for Pound Box Report all over the internet, all over s- social media, the interwebs, if you will. Uh, pages on Facebook, on Google+, on YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, uh, Podomatic, where you'll find past episodes of the Pound for Pound Box Report podcast. we got a Pinterest board. We're also on Stitcher Radio. Just go to stitcherradio.com, look and do a search for Pound for Pound Boxing Report. That's P-O-U-N-D, the number four, P-O-U-N-D Boxing Report, and check us out there. And also leave us some comments uh, about how well we're doing with the show and what we can do to improve the show. And lastly, we got our RSS feed you can subscribe to. Our email address for the Pound for Pound Box Report, which is P4PBoxingRPT at gmail.com. We'll repeat that, P4PBoxingRPT at gmail.com. As well as a link where you can donate your account. The link for that is donateyouraccount.com forward slash P4P Box Report. Let me repeat that donateyouraccount.com forward slash P4P Box Report. And what happens with that is any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Box Report Twitter page to be a friend, be a pal, be a buddy, and donate your Twitter account. Any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Box Report Twitter page, your Twitter account will automatically retweet any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Box Report Twitter page. So. Please do be please uh, do us a favor and uh, donate your Twitter account. And with that being said, let's get the show going this week. Really, as Gail was saying, really a off weekend um, in boxing. Uh, no real significant bout. So with that, we're going to go straight to the news. Um, some news that broke today. Uh, Marco Huck, uh, WBO longtime WBO cruiserweight champion, uh, really big star in Germany. A uh, pretty significant fighter over in Europe announced today that he will be making his United States debut on June 12th, as he as he will be fighting, uh, as he will fight. And excuse me if I butcher his name. My apologies. Chris Christoph Glowacki. Um, the fight is going to happen on June 12th in either Chicago or New York. Uh, I'll go to you on this one, Addy. Um, for those who are not familiar with Marco Huck. Uh, let the folks know what kind of fighter he, he is and give us some insight uh, on his popularity, uh, maybe in Germany as well as throughout all of Europe. Yeah, he's a, he's a real sort of big deal out in Germany. Um, I think he's, you know, he's, he's been a sort of long-time world champion at the cruiserweight division. The cruiserweight division doesn't normally get much exposure, really. Um, it's one of those divisions where people are sort of, you know, <clears throat> coming up from light heavyweight, probably not just heavyweights, and um, you know can't sort of make it in either in either sort of hot division, and they end up as a cruiserweight. But but Hook's a really a really big, strong guy. Um, he tends to stay out in Germany and uh, sort of beat these guys coming through. He is done exceptionally well. Um, the the guy he's fighting, uh, Glowacki, is an unbeaten guy, um, but I don't know a great deal about him to be honest. So we'll, we'll have to see. Um, I think you were saying earlier in our sort of pre-chat that he's he might be going to the states to Chicago for this one, which is good. It will give him some exposure out in the states. 
Um, there aren't really any sort of big cruiserweight fights out there for him at the moment, I don't think. But um, I don't know. Maybe you could tell me more about about that division, um, Michael and Gale, because I'm, I'm not really hot on that division. I remember seeing his fights with Ola Ofalabi, and and you know, he's more of a sort of jumped up sparring partner though, Ola, bless him. Um, so I don't really sort of rate him that that highly. So um, yeah, it'd be good to see him in there, hopefully with somebody decent soon. Yeah, to your point, the cruiserweight division is not really that exciting. He Huck is the most known fighter in that division. You have other fighters like Lebedev, uh, Yohan Pablo Hernandez. Lebedev fights mainly in Russia. Hernandez, a uh, Cuban transplant, if you will, fights largely in Germany as well. I would have thought by now those two would have fought. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't. I don't know why. Um, backroom politics, maybe, maybe they just can't come up with the money to satisfy both fighters. Uh, you mentioned how you, you mentioned how Huck uh, cruiserweights often they try their shots at the heavyweight division, and Huck did that back in I want to say uh, 2012 exactly. Exactly, uh, he went up and fought Alex Povetkin. Uh, gave Povetkin a heck of a fight, in my opinion, a very close fight. Hurt Povetkin late in that fight, uh, so he's had his uh, chance at cruiserweight. I suspect eventually he will, a heavyweight, excuse me, I suspect he eventually move back up to heavyweight since there's really no significant fights at cruiserweight. Tuckle him fighting ex-champion Johnny, Johnny Nelson, who was talking uh, towards the end of 2014 about coming out of retirement to fight Marco Hub. I never thought much of that because it just didn't make any sense to me. It was just talk. I go to you on this, Miguel. Again, the fact that you are a media member in boxing here in the States, uh, hardcore media member, I, I should say, uh, any talk amongst your um, comrades in the media uh, within the boxing world about Marco Huck and about this move uh, to heavyweight? Is it is it too little, too late? Is it right on time? Uh, your thoughts? I'm not hearing a lot about it, but uh, you know he's going exactly the right place in in the U.S. In my opinion, um, to make his debut uh, at this level. Um, you know, right to the heart of the U.S., where you have a lot of people who do have ties to the Germanic old country, um, you know, as, as it were. I think they'll welcome seeing a guy like that. They're good fans. Chicago fans are, are good sports fans in general. So it's not as odd, um, odd as a, a move as it seems. Um, and I. It, it's worth a try. I think that's really the way we need to look at it. It's sort of a, well, why the heck not uh, give it a try? Cruiserweight, as you said, it's just a really odd weight class. You know, as heavyweights have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, it is tougher for these guys who are in that odd right in between spot. You know, they, they can't quite make it down to light heavyweight, but they can't quite compete with heavyweights like, you know, I was at a fight a week ago with two guys that both weighed 260 for God's sake. You know, yeah. what is a guy like Marco Huck supposed to do? Is this really the only opportunity he's he's got though to, um, you know, to continue? Because you're right, there's no opponents left out for him. Oh, maybe except for Roy Jones Jr., who about a month ago talked about fighting Marco Huck, which is just, you know, just more talk from Roy. What can you say? <laughs> but I like it. I, I'd say good for him. Give it a shot. He's got truly. He's got nothing to lose. Um, any more? Uh, co any more additional comments before we move on at it? Yeah, just that. Um, you know, I mean, to be fair to him, he's been champion in that division for probably a good sort of five or six years with sort of twelve, thirteen defenses, and he's sort of beaten everybody. But. Um, I don't know whether, I mean, the guy he's fighting is Polish, so I think there's probably a bit of a move to, um, there's probably quite a decent Polish community, I'd imagine, in Chicago as well. Um, you might be able to tell me more on that, but, you know, maybe a fight like that might get the fans in and, um, you know, not might be a nice bit of exposure for him out there. But, you know, that's a good point. Uh, there was a fight staged last summer in Chicago at Comiskey Park, if I recall, was one of the ball, one of the 
outdoor state you know arenas. I think it was Comiskey Park, and uh, uh, Andre Fonfara was in the main event. And um, you know what? They had a great turnout. Absolutely a great turnout. So it's uh, it's it's a good little venue for them. And uh, you're right. They'll you know in Chicago you have to declare yourself. So all the Polish fans will come out. All all the German American you know. Fans will come out. They'll sell a lot of bratwurst, and everyone will be happy. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, let's let's move on and talk about some more news that moved down this week. That kind of all broke today. Kind of had a uh, series of news uh, that broke today. Uh, Match from Sports uh, promoter of James DeGale announced that the much talked about DeGale bout with Andre Durrell for the vacant IBF Super Middleweight title, which was vacated by uh, Carl Frotch. That fight will take place on May 23rd in Boston. Um, the vibe over there at it, and I'll go to you on this one once again, the vibe over there at it um, in the UK about DeGale and Darrell. Personally, I look at this fight, I, I, I'm looking forward to it, personally. I think it's a 50-50 fight. I can see scenarios where both fighters will win. I will give my official prediction of the week of the fight. But again, I, this is a fight I'm pretty excited about at it. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited about this one as well. Um, over here, and um, people already start getting behind the girl because it's a really tough fight for him. Um, it's very 50 50. I can't pick a winner at the moment. They're both extremely slick guys. Um, I think they can both both punch hard to a degree as well uh, when they really sort of let go. It could be a really, it could be a really tactical fight actually. Um, and you know, I don't know if it will turn into a ball fest because of that, but you know, hopefully it won't, and it will turn into a sort of really uh, sort of slick, uh, <clears throat> slick fight that turns into a bit of a war where both of them, you know, it's probably close going into the later rounds, and somebody's got to go for it. But but yeah, pleased that it's announced. I'm not sure DeGale's that pleased about the fact that he lost the purse bid and Matchroom didn't manage to get it over in England. Um, so DeGale seemed to, he's had it the hard way really the last couple of years, trying to get this, this big world championship fight and then when he eventually, he has got it, he's got to go to the States and beat Darrell. So it's a very, very tough ask. Uh, your thoughts, Gail? Like the fight a lot. Um, it's a, a nice bold move by DeGale. He's going to have to come over here, but um, he should take heart from his countryman, Kel Brook, who came over uh, even farther to California and still managed to get out of the decision. So um, I, I think he'll do well. And I tell you, my money went right this minute. I think I'd have to go with DeGale, but I'd like to see both of them. Uh, start training and see how everyone looks in the uh, work up to the fight. Uh, I also like the fact that it's not in one of the usual areas that they're going to fight in Boston. The more boxing can stage really good events outside of New York, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles, uh, I, I really, really like seeing that happen. Do you think they can draw a significant crowd out there in Boston? I think so. I think because of the time of year, um, you know, I mean, yeah, but baseball's going on, but, uh, you know, it's not football season, it's not hockey season, and, it, you know, in many ways, great sports towns are, you know, great fans for nearly anything, and I think the novelty of it will draw a lot of people. Uh, the hardcore fans will be there, and Boston's close enough so that if anyone does want to come from anywhere else in the northeastern United States, you know, if they're really motivated, they can. And I love it. I think they'll do fine. I think they'll do fine with a good crowd. Yeah, I think a lot of the British fans will go over because they'll probably go over for a couple of days in New York and then go down to the fight. So um, I think they're hoping that quite a lot of the Brits will go over for it as well. Um, let's move on. Um, Audley Harrison, uh, who I've certainly had my issues with in the past, uh, let's face it, he's been a disappointment his career, throughout his career. Uh, sorry, Wendy. You know I love you, bro, but and I know he loves some Audley Harrison, but hey, <laughs> he's been a disappointment his entire career, where um, on his website he announced his retirement uh, today from the sport. Uh, if you go to, excuse me, I'm a 
go to OddlyHarrison.com. He wrote a letter, uh, basically said his career has come to an end, um, said he's no longer a professional boxer. That's good with me, quoting him. Um, after locking myself away for a few weeks, my paraphrasing now, I've decided to focus and turn back the clock, get himself in uh that he, basically he's saying he's 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 had his share of the sport. He's decided to call it a day. Uh, I'll go see Mr. Gale before I go to Addicts and get his perspective from the UK side. Uh, I spoke in my piece on Ali Harrison. Um, your thoughts on the fear of, and if, if you hear any background noise, that's just Gale's dog. So that's my, my dog deciding to have at it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he's much of a Harrison fan. Huh? What can I say? You know, it's it's really tough for these guys who make a splash at the Olympic level. Um, you know, to translate their success, you know, in the amateur ranks to the professional. You know, and Harrison made. You know, and I'm looking off. Let Attic have at it. My dog yeah, it looks it. like you got to tend to your dog. So, um, Attic here, uh, your perspective uh, of the career. Oh, Audley Harrison. Yeah, well, Audley was uh, obviously the guy who won the he won the heavyweight gold medal, and you know he, he sort of came out of the Olympics with um, a lot of backing in Britain. Um, he managed to get himself a deal, a ten fight deal with BBC, um, which was when BBC um, obviously were doing boxing. Um, they don't anymore. I don't think they have since his last fight, actually. I might be wrong there, but I think that may have been the end of boxing, actually, once his 10-fight deal was up. Um, he knocked out sort of 10 guys, pretty much, one after the other, um, and looked okay. And then he started stepping up, and he had a lot of sort of promotional issues. He was promoting himself, basically, which sort of hindered him a little bit. Um because he was trying to get his money's worth out of the game and, you know, promoters weren't having on, having him on his shows and he wasn't getting the best fights. Um, but he eventually kind of stepped up and then we found out pretty quickly that he's either lacking a little bit of heart or he wasn't doing the training properly. Um, there was something really amiss and he wasn't the slick kind of, um, you know, big puncher that we thought he was really. Um but we all still kind of, I don't know, we, we've always had a sort of up and down relationship with him. And, um, I mean, we all sort of wanted to believe that when he got in there with Danny, uh, David Hay that he, he had a chance. And he sort of convinced everybody that he had a chance. Um, but he didn't throw a punch. Uh, he didn't throw a, literally throw a punch in that fight. It was just disgraceful. Um, and David Hay duly knocked him out and uh, we thought that would be the end of it. And then since then, he's, he's come back once or twice again. Um, again, in the De Deontay Wilder fight, in his last fight, he sort of convinced everybody that, you know, if he boxes like he can do, he could have an opportunity. Um, how can I put this? How can I put this? Uh, for me, your thoughts, as you will say, I see that you're back, Gil. Your thoughts... <laughs> This is the right thing for him to do. I mean, this is the second time Harrison has retired, and, and as I was so rudely interrupted before by my canine, uh, you know, sometimes it's just really tough to translate your success from the amateurs into the professional ranks, especially when you have distractions. And, you know, he, I think he got a, a bit distracted along the way in his career by, you know, his his celebrity and it, it happens you know you end up with making a deviation off into reality TV and that you know, kind of tells you what you need to know about where an athlete's priorities lie you know, there are a few a limited few people who can handle that but for a, a lot of athletes they cannot they just can't and you know if he's citing head injuries that's certainly a um, you know that's sort of a faith saving thing for him to do and Everybody can go along and say, well, yeah, okay, that's the reason that uh, you're retiring, but we all probably know what the real reason is. Sadly, he's apparently having money troubles and bank facing bankruptcy, and yeah, I wish him well. I, I'm sure he's a, a terrific guy, but I think 
I think he made a good move to get out of the boxing ring and focus on what he needs to do. Yeah, to your point, um, uh, Harrison in his letter talked about him having issues with maybe uh, brain issues, uh, the effects of brain issues. Um, he also mentioned how he had uh, vision issues, um, vestibular issues, and uh, had made him lose his balance and whatever. He's wanting to get that treated. So again, Harrison, it's easy to knock him uh, for his him not living, him not fighting up to his talent, let's just say. To me, he was a guy who had the talent but just didn't have the desire at the heart uh, to work hard. And when things got tough, he, he kind of folded. But it, as you were saying, Gail, at this right time, this is the right time for him to retire. Um, there's no need for him to move on. And let's just hope he has a safe and productive career from this point forward. Uh, I got to go to you on this one, Gail. It was announced that Skybox office bought the pay-per-view rights for Pacquiao, Mayweather Pacquiao um, in the UK. And we come to find out that they they're that they are charging I believe nineteen stone, is it right at it? Uh, it'll be it'll be twenty it'll be twenty pounds, so probably 20 about pounds. probably about twenty three or four dollars that would be. How do you feel? We don't know the pep. We don't know the pay-per-view prices yet, but it's been estimated that pay-per-view prices may be eighty-nine bucks, maybe even more. Um, how annoying is it that folks everywhere else, the UK specifically, has to get to pay such a low price for Mayweather Pacquiao, while we here in the states have to, if you're going to order pay-per-view, you have to pay such a such a high price, an enormous price for such a bout. I know it's the biggest bout since De La Hoya Trinidad in 99, but still. Yeah, I mean, do you want to go to this one? For uh, I think Gail is muted right now. She's tending yeah. to her dogs again, so. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Are you back, Gail? <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't, uh, I don't begrudge the British fans the uh, opportunity to see the fight. Uh, <laughs> At a lower price tag. You know, I don't be going to be the my problem is how we have to pay so much for the price while they don't. Hey, it's what the market will bear, you know, and uh, there's enough fans here to, you know, it's supply and demand, and uh, there's going to be more demand. People are willing to pay it. So, you know, HBO and Showtime, they can, they can go ahead and pay, you know, and charge premium dollar because everyone is going to bitch, everyone's going to grumble. And everyone's gonna pony up. <laughs> I mean, that's the way it goes. Obviously, it's either a tougher sell in Great Britain, or the fans are, uh, you know, willing to stand their ground and say, "Don't you dare charge me the, you know, that equivalent." Um, is you aren't gonna get it. So, you know, it'll be interesting though to see. I assume when the, the deal was made that there was an agreement up front between Showtime and HBO that they'd charge the same price. Because if you get into a bidding war, that's going to be an interesting situation. I, I, I assume that's not going to happen, though. I, you know, everybody's going to get the same price. And the, the word is that for standard definition television, it'll be 90 bucks, And for high definition television, it'll be... A hundred bucks, ninety nine, ninety five. Wow! Yeah, yeah. You invite, you invite a lot of your friends and make them bring the alcohol. Right. <laughs> I heard it was a bidding war between the uh, um, with uh, Skybox and someone else. Attic. Um, how did yeah. do you have any insight on how uh, Skybox yeah. ended up winning? Well, what what happens over here generally is. Um, Box Nation, which is Frank Warren's uh, um, <clears throat> station, um, they normally get the big US fights. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you have to subscribe to Box Nation usually to get those fights. And he does also put on the odd pay per view. Um, but I think I think Eddie Hearns had a, had a word with Sky about this and said you must get this fight on Sky because down the line. His plan is obviously for Kell Brook to get a shot at either Pacquiao or Mayweather. So I think they want it on Sky so Sky viewers can see it um, and sort of keep that all aligned. 
But yeah, I mean, going back, I mean, twenty pounds over here, uh, unbelievably, is actually the most we have ever paid for a pay per view fight. Oh wow! So, yeah, so this is, um, you know, you guys paying that amount over there is just crazy. But like Gail says, it's it's market forces, and I think, I think probably the networks over there have trained the boxing fans to pay more over the years. Um, whereas over here, pay per view is, you know, once or twice a year. Um, people are already paying a lot for their subscriptions to these sports channels, so they can't really get away with paying a lot more than that. Um, the fans wouldn't buy it if you started going up to 25, 30, 40 pounds. So, so yeah, 20 pounds is fair enough. I'll certainly be tuning into that one as uh, I think it will do really well over here, as it will do well all over the world, I would imagine. Well, the estimate today is that uh, they they think the the in person gate will be 74 million. That's the gate at the venue, 74 million, and. Um, Gosh, and now I've got to go back and look up my pay-per-view estimates, but it's it's an outrageous amount of money. The, yeah, the amount hearing, of money involved in this fight is really stratospheric. I'm hearing I'm hearing over 400 million in all. Wow. Yeah, not not a surprise, and that the uh, guys between them, Mayweather and Pacquiao, are going to between them, mind you, um, walk out of there with 250 million. I'm hearing that Mayweather's making 120 and Pacquiao's going to make 80, 90. Yeah. Yeah, I think I could retire on that if I needed to. But we all could. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't know. Flo Floyd will have to cut back his spending in retirement. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know if you heard this news. Uh, Attic breaking news kind of broke. I'm just searching um, the internet. Um, ITV's return to boxing was dealt a blow uh, when. Um, CWM Capital World Markets, uh, which sponsored uh, Carl Frampton's recent defense of Avalos, was raided. Uh, potential fraud investigation. Um, have you heard anything about that? I've not heard anything about that. That's the first I've, I've heard, actually. Um, I'm not sure why that would affect ITV so much. Uh, according to this, uh, CWM Capital World Markets, FX had a sponsorship deal with McGuigan. As well as his other sporting outlets, uh, so that's probably that has to do that part of the reason why it, it affects McGuigan. So I was just wondering, have you heard anything about this kind of breaking news? No, it's a bit of a strange one. I mean, I'd have thought that affects obviously McGuigan and Frampton, but not so much ITV as a broadcaster, if you know what I mean. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look into that one a bit more, but. I know, um, I know Eddie Hearn had a meeting with uh, the McGuigans, I think it was today actually, to talk about the quick Frampton fight to see if they can move along with that and, um, and work out whether it's going to be on ITV or Sky and whether they can get the done deal. So hoping to hear some good things from that. In the next I'm week. glad you updated me because I was going to ask you, uh, any news uh, regarding uh, Frampton quick, what should happen? I uh, hope it will happen this summer. I was wondering any news where when, um, what locale. Uh, so thanks for the update on that. Uh, last news bit of the day before we go to the preview. Preview what's going down this weekend. Uh, short show, by the way. Uh, the WBC mandated that um, Kovalev, that's, I mean, Stevenson uh, fight Kovalev. Uh, I'll go to you on this one, Gail. Adonis Stevenson fighting Kovalev. What does it really mean? Will it sway Persuade the fight to happen. Uh, we know it was talk about it, talks about it happening last year. It bogged down because, depending on who you believe, Kathy Duva or Stevenson's camp, uh, does this persuade? Did this way any? Did this make? Uh, does this mean that this fight will happen eventually, or this or is just this news that doesn't mean anything at the end of the day? This is a non-factor, a nothing factor in making the fight. It won't influence it positively. It won't influence it negatively. It will happen on its own terms without regard to this announcement today. Stevenson and and his his man, Mr. Heyman, can do whatever they damn well want to. If it's in their best interest, they'll make the fight. If it's not, 
no belt, no decree will make him do it. That's the bottom line. I do think the fight will happen eventually, um, but it will be on Al Heyman and Adonis Stevenson's terms. Um, and I think as long as Kathy Duva protects Kovalev's best interests, um, she'll figure out a way to go along to get along with those guys without giving up too much, and it'll eventually happen because she firmly believes Kovalev could beat him and beat him handily. So you put it in a similar category to WBC, the WBC mandating that uh, Koto fight Golovkin and it really doesn't mean anything. Yeah, that it's right up there. Now, now Koto did an interview tonight uh, on US TV uh, prior to ESPN's Thursday night edition of Friday Night Fights. He has apparently set a June 6th fight date although there is no named opponent, although now the name in circulation, it, it was uh, prior to the date announcement, um, uh, Brundage, but he's made a fight. Now it's potentially Ishe Smith, of all people, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, step it, down. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, go figure. But, um, you know, sometimes these guys get to the point that it's less about the fight than who's in charge of making making the show happen. You know, they end up being more in the producer's seat than the performer's seat, which is a real problem. Um, but yeah, it, it, you know, the the overarching discussion here, which we could really could do a whole show on, is the meaning or the meaningless of the belt system these days and how many belts are out there and how many meaningless you know super this and alphabet soup that you know the fans have just said screw it we have no idea there are fans today that have no idea what a lineal champion means you know a very basic term in boxing the man who beat the man etc you know they have to have it explained over and over and really you can't blame them because every damn fool has a belt out there. You know, you can go down to the liquor store and buy one at this point. So belts, you know, people people know who they want to see. They know who the top guys are. Uh, you know, belts are not the determining factor like they used to be. Right, and, that, and, and that's why when I've heard other shows on other uh, on the white white TBC. Uh, saying that they're applauding the WBC for this move, uh, for uh, mandating that Koto fight Golovkin. I mean, my response has been, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter based on the fighter. Uh, if you're a Koto or if you're a Stevenson, and you get to a certain point, you don't care about the belt. It's about the money more than anything else. Damn the belt. If they had their way, uh, they would disregard the belt because they pay so much sanction, so much money in sanctioning fees. So, and, and with also the proliferation of titles, even within a certain sanctioning body. I mean, the WBA ought to be ashamed of themselves, a regular champion, an interim champion, a super champion. Come on, man. You, 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 reduce, you reduce the impact and the significance of a world title by doing that. So, and, and, and from a fan's perspective, they don't have the patience or the time to sit there and, and, and pay attention to uh, who's the regular champion, who's the super champion, who's this and that. They want to know who is who is the champ. Who is the champ? Right. They can, I, I would argue they would they would I would argue that fans today would take a three sectioning bodies if you didn't have the situation where you had all these interim champions, they would take a WBA a simple WBA champion, a simple IBF champion, simple WBC, simple WBO, and have them fight defending titles or whatever. But what's insulting is you having no offense to Scott Quigg, I know they're fans of his. Don't insult my intelligence by calling him a WB, by saying he is the WBA's uh, junior featherweight champion. But anybody with a brain knows that Riggle was the WBA's junior featherweight champion. Yeah. This is the problem. Um, you know, unfortunately, boxing has always been about sort of making money um, for the guys who are involved in it, you know, putting the fights on, etc. Um so it's all about sanctioning fees for each governing body. 
Um, I mean, we were talking earlier about you know Marco Hook, who is the WBO champion. Now the WBO have tended to um, they've found a sort of good friend in Germany where they can get these champions over the years and keep them fighting regularly, beating nobodies, and keep getting the sanctioning fees in. Um, you know, and they've all they've all basically um, you know set up these sort of fake champions, interims, all of this sort of stuff um, to, to keep the fights going and keep uh, keep the sanctioning fees coming in. So it's not going to change very quickly, but like you say, we know who the top guys are. Um, is it a good thing that they're making these guys fight each other or that they're putting them in as um, uh, saying they have to fight each other? I mean, it's happening with Ward and Frotch at the moment as well. Whether these guys will ever actually agree to fight, or they'll just say, "I don't care about the belts," and they'll go and do their own thing, they'll probably just do that. To be honest, <laughs> but, um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's always it's been a bit of a mess for a while now. But I suppose it can only be a good thing if they're trying to sort of tidy up their their championships. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's move on and go to preview what's happening this weekend. Um, Headline for me is Kell Brook uh, coming back from uh, his stabbing accident, which he was uh, stabbed uh, while on vacation in um, Spain, Tenerife, I believe it was. He's returning to the ring to make his first title defense, defending his uh, IBF welterweight title uh, against Jojo Dan, mandatory challenger. Uh, fight's going to happen in his hometown of Sheffield. And Gail, this is good news for us in the, in the U.S. The, fight's, the fight will not it will air not only on Showtime, but it will air live on Showtime. Uh, so kudos for Showtime for uh, making that move. Um, Brooke, as far as I was concerned, very impressive uh, in winning the title from Sean Porter last August. Um, there was we, we, we were a little bit worried about him getting the decision coming from the from the, coming from the UK to the US. But uh, kudos to the judges, as you said said on a few shows back for uh, doing the right thing and, and giving him the decision. Uh, fighting Jojo Dan. Jojo Dan is a tricky fighter. Um, moves a lot, southpaw stance. Um, has some quick hands, but to me, the difference is the accuracy uh, of Kell Brook. He has to keep a high punch rate uh, because Dan, have, he has a tendency to throw a lot of punches, but I just think the accuracy, and I just think that Brook, he's a better caliber of fighter in, in terms of class. Um, I think they will... Uh, that will be the difference, and for me, I will make my official prediction. I'm going with Brooke by a decision. Uh, it may have some sloppy points, but I just think his overall class, his precision, his accuracy, and his timing uh, will be the difference at the end of the day. Agreed, agreed, and agreed. Um, I think that um, this is a good move for him. I know he probably would have liked a little bigger name, but you know, due to his unfortunate situation, you know, he has had to lay off a lot longer than he wanted to, and uh, he's going to need a fight at this level, you know, still something that he can't overlook, something to push him, but I don't think he'll have much trouble, I really don't, and uh, he, he will win by being accurate, by being busy, um, it's a, it's a, you know, there are some fights that are Make work fights that are still pretty good fights. You know, they're smart fights for the for the combatants involved. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing him. I want to see where he is right now after he's been off for a few months, after he's rehabilitated himself a little bit, and see if what we watched last August was, um, you know, a one-time thing or not. I don't I don't think it was. I have no reason to believe he won't make a real good show. And then he can, you know, where he, when he knows where he stands, then he can start talking about a big opponent. And we all know who that is. Uh, Mike, I'll tell you on, on this attic, uh, uh, the perception, the thoughts, uh, what's the vibe for Brooks' a title defense against Jojo Dan? Or, and are there any pressing concerns about the leg injury that Kell Brooks suffered, uh, any worries that he may not be um, at full strength here? It doesn't seem to be. Um, he's certainly saying all the right things. Um, in that training's, training's gone well and his rehabilitation's gone well. Um, I mean, I don't know if anybody's actually seen the scar leg. It's, it's horrific. Um, yeah, I saw uh, it. I saw, I mean, I saw it. Yeah, it is. 
It's a nasty yeah, looking scar. It's a, wow, it's huge, you know, from one side of the leg to the other. It's Some people would say impressive. <laughs> Impre yeah. <laughs> It's a good little point <laughs> when, uh, yeah, people are comparing scores. Yeah. Oh, in, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so I mean, hopefully, Kel's on the right track. He's had, I mean, he's he's such an impressive boxer. Um, he's he's you know been trained out of the Ingle Gym that we all know about Prince Nazim Hamed and the rest of them that have come out of there. Um, and he's got a really impressive style. Uh, he's a good puncher as well uh, when he really wants to let them yeah. go. He's, uh, he's very, Johnny, very Johnny Nelson, Johnny Nelson uh, Bomber Graham all came from that camp. So, yeah. That's right. Well, Bomber Graham was a Nottingham man, actually, where I'm from, and he used to train up at the Ingle Gym. And people, people from the Ingle Gym always said Harold Bomber Graham was the best of the lot, actually. Um, unfortunately, he never made it to a world, world title. He got knocked oh, out. Yeah. But, um, yeah, as an aside, I'll let you continue on. I've always thought that um, yeah. Graham, of that lot between Eubank and Ben and Watson, uh, Collins, I think Bob McGram, if he ever would have fought any of them, he would have beat all of them. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. He was just very unlucky, actually. He just came to the end of his career as all those guys were coming through. Um, and he had the unfortunate pleasure of running into that right hand from Julian Jackson. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, they used to just quickly on Bomber Graham. They used to have a ring in Nottingham in a place called Colic, where um, people would pay to get in the ring with Bomber Graham. And if you managed, if you managed to hit him within three minutes, you'd get some money. And nobody could hit him. Well, though, that's, though I will say, you bet him that one time when he sparred with him, didn't hit him for two weeks and landed that one shot and put him on his butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. But, um, but yeah, Bob Graham was a bit of a yeah. He turned into a little bit of a circus act, unfortunately. But what a fantastic boxer. But yeah, um, back to Brook. He's, he's you know I think he's fantastic. He should win tomorrow night. Um, he's going to have a full house in Sheffield. It's all there for him. I, I can't see him losing. I see him actually stopping Dan. I did watch Dan's last fight against uh, Bizier in Canada, and that was obviously a really good win for him to go out there and beat the hometown fighter. So he's got a little bit of something about him. Um, he's also for Aiden, um, the Turkish guy, who we sort of know over here a little bit. Um, I think he fought Guerrero for a for a title a little while ago. But um, yeah, and you know he's not a bad fighter, Aiden, but. But Jojo Dan got got on the end of two. He lost to him twice by a point. Uh, they were both robberies, really, out in Turkey. Um, so it really is. He should be an unbeaten fighter, Jojo Dan, coming into this. So can't take him lightly. But but Brooks should hopefully have the skills to to see him off. Um, I mean, hopefully with with the uh, you know, his only problem has been over the years that outside of the ring. He seems to get himself involved in these incidents every now and again, and I'm ho I'm hoping um, Eddie Hearn's got him on straight and narrow now because it's sort of kind of happened a little bit too often. And I actually know from personal experience a little bit of um, sort of Kel's personality because when I was over at the Super Six watching the um, the Ward Watch fight, Kel was with the camp and everything, and. Um, he was on the undercard. Now, after his fights, or after the, all the fights, it was literally just myself and him sat in a bar. Um, I think it was Bally's, one of the casinos, and he he was drunk. He was absolutely steaming drunk. Oh wow! And, <laughs> you know, we're having it. We're having a chat, and because um, I'm the only in, other English guy, there, and I sort of knew the camp a little bit and that sort of thing. And um, anyway, he's. He's really steaming drunk. And these four guys next to us, these four sort of black New Yorker guys, whatever, and they're saying to me, you know, Joe, is this, is that the guy who was fighting tonight? I said, yeah, that's that's Kel. I said, should, should he be drinking? I said, no, he shouldn't really. But, you know, oh, wow. <laughs> but he's, he's got this personality where he can turn in a second. He can be a little bit sort of aggressive and stuff. Um, and he's got these sort of demons in his head. I know he's had a lot of problems with his family in the past and things like that. And he's just one of these guys that really needs to be kept on the straight and narrow. So um, when I heard about this stabbing incident, um, it was one of those. It sort of it sent me back a little bit to sort of that night. And I thought, 
yeah, his personality can be a little bit, you know, where it could possibly get him into trouble. Um, so, yeah, hopefully all that's behind him now because um, he's a fantastic boxer. Dad, I'm, 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 it made me pause because uh, I've always known about him in ex exploits in the ring. I, I did not know that about him outside the ring. I knew he had a bit of a cheeky side in him. Uh, he likes to play games with certain fighters. Uh, a little bit of a story here where um, he was at Mayweather's gym watching him spar. And the, and the word is that Mayweather invited him to come down to the front row to watch him spar. And he told him he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. Uh, one of Mayweather's handlers insisted that he come down to the front row to see him spar. He would do it. Then after three rounds of watching Mayweather spar, he just probably got up and walked out of the gym. Kind of gave him a nod in the week as he left. So I knew that side of it, but I didn't know this other side of Kell Brook. Did you, Gail? I, no, but, you know, it, it never surprises me when I hear that about a boxer. You know, they kind of fall into two categories. They fall in the category of what you see in the ring is what you see outside the ring. You know, and we're asking guys to be combative and aggressive, and if they're that way in the ring, you know, none of us should really be too surprised that that occasionally manifests itself outside the ring, especially when you have a little alcohol in you. You're and that, right. you know, that's true of a lot of athletes. I'll tell you exactly who this made me think about was infamous, um, you know, Yankees pitcher David Wells who's from my neck of the woods, um, who got into bar brawls and all kinds of crazy stuff while he was pitching and admits that he pitched his perfect game in the World Series with a wicked hangover. Right, so, right. You know, these are guys that live big and they have, you know, big appetites and, you know, the temper is big too. I mean, they're either, they're either in that camp or in the camp where you see guys like, Gennady Golovkin, who his own trainer describes as, as a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Outside the ring, he's like Mr. Rogers. You know, he's got his little cardigan sweater on. He's polite. He's, you know, he's got great manners. He's very soft spoken. And inside the ring, he's an absolute maniac. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of one or the other. I, but it's, I love hearing those stories. It always cracks me up. Um, you know, and when you see these guys, even for a few minutes outside the spotlight or with, you know, with their circle, you can kind of tell which camp they fall into pretty fast. Yeah. So, so let's hope uh, going forward, number one, well, let's hope going forward that he kind of learns to tame, to calm that dark side of him. Because if he does it, uh, it will really have an effect on him in his career. He will not, I will be, repeat, he will not beat the upper echelon in the world to work division if he has those episodes of just wild, being wild and just madness uh, yeah. about him. Uh, let's move on to uh, Doubleheader in Las Vegas on Saturday. Uh, Brooke and JoJo Dan is going to be airing that afternoon here in the States. Uh, the Doubleheader in Las Vegas, um, Showtime Doubleheader will be airing on, airing that evening. Um, Johnny Gonzalez defending his featherweight belt against Gary Russell Jr. on, on, on the card. Jamel Charlo fighting in Ronis Monterose. And, um, I want to focus on Gonzalez Russell Jr. first. Surprising to me uh, that Russell Jr., according to the Vegas bookies, he is the slight favorite in this bout. Um, and in searching Twitter and stuff right now and checking some of the comments, a lot of people have Gary Russell Jr. as a, a real life underdog even in the aftermath of him being, as far as I'm concerned, dominated by, in his last fight by Lomachenko uh, for the w, vacant WBO belt, which uh, Lomachenko, I, I thought, won from beginning to end. Uh, I guess folks are figuring that the speed of Gary Russell, uh, hand and foot, will provide some problems for uh, Johnny Gonzalez. For me, Gonzalez can be a bit bipolar in the ring in terms of his performance, but... Um, if he's on, I just think his experience, uh, his overall size, his length, and his power um, will give Gary Russell Jr. all kinds of problems. And plus, I don't think Russell Jr. has to punch to keep uh, Gonzalez off of him. And any of you got any of you can chime in, Gail, boxing at it. Um, your thoughts on uh, Gary Russell being the favorite going into this bout? Uh, it's inexplicable to me. I mean, I, 
now we do have to bear in mind that you know bookies bookies rankings are not always about who's you know who's the more skilled you know competitor in whatever sporting event it is you know this is this is all about money flow and a lot of other things and you know it just starts to make me wonder you know who's pouring money into this over in Vegas you know who who's you know it's 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 like you know somebody you know putting their hand down on one end of the scale and hoping you don't look at it it's kind of strange there's no there's no way on this green earth that Gary Russell should be the favorite he's not the favorite um, you know if you do even the you know slightest bit of following the sport um, you know Johnny Gonzalez is is you know ranked on on paper and on the internet you know higher on every category it, it, some things I guess you just have to tell yourself I can't explain that and I can't explain this one I just can't uh, your thoughts on this Ed? maybe I'm thinking another scenario is they uh, maybe the bookies are feeling that um, Gonzalez coming off of such a long layoff. I think this is his first fight since he um, shot the world by knocking out Abner Morris in the first round last year. Coming off of such a long layoff, they may have a uh, that may play into his into the fight. But again, uh, I co-sign Gail this on this one. I think it, I, I agree with her. I just don't see how Gonzalez is the underdog coming into this. Uh, uh, Russell is talented. But his loss to Lomachenko showed a lot to me. He, he, there's something missing with him. I'm, I'm gonna have to disagree with both of you, I'm afraid. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, now I hadn't really seen Gary Russell Jr., so I went back and watched the fight with Lomachenko because I missed it at the time, um, and I thought he did exceptionally well, and I thought it was quite a close fight. Now. I know you said um, Lomachenko sort of dominated him, but I and I only had it to maybe Lomachenko by sort of two, three rounds. Um, and I thought he boxed really well. I thought he showed that he's got very good jab, a good body punch. He's fast. Um, and I thought he did extremely well to stay in there with Lomachenko at times. Um, so I'm actually slightly favouring Gary Russell Jr. in this fight, to be honest. Um, I don't, I don't agree, and you're absolutely right that he shouldn't be favourite with the bookmakers. Gonzalez should be the favourite on his experience and what he's achieved, etc. Um, but no, my prediction is Gary Russell to win a points decision. Well, interesting. Look, uh, we don't have to all agree on this show. I, I embrace the bait. Um, I just think that, first of all, I thought over the second half of the fight in particular, uh, for round four, five on uh, Lomachenko, he really came on strong and dominated uh, Russell. And if that bout would have went 15 rounds, uh, Lomachenko would have knocked him out. Um, yeah, yeah I, agree with, I agree with that. In the last round, he sort of went for it a bit more and he looked like he could stop him. Yeah, I think it was one of those fights, though, where Lomachenko was sort of winning the rounds, but he was giving as good as he was getting at times in there. And I was really impressed with Gary Russell Jr. in that fight, actually. Uh, you want to chime in on this, Gail? I I'm glad when we don't all agree, because it uh, it helps that somebody else has the alternate explanation and a uh, different look at it. That's what makes this sport fun, in my opinion, right. uh, that we all come at it from different angles. Um, you know, I We'll we'll see what happens. I I think that um, part of the reason that we were all favoring Gonzalez so much over Russell was, you know, not necessarily that it was a horrible performance against Lomachenko, but it's that old nemesis called expectations, and he did he failed to live up to expectations. And really, that's one of the worst things that can happen to you in any sport. And, and boxing, you know, is right at the top of that. If somebody expects you to, you know, win and win handily, and you don't, it's a disaster. You know, he could have had the same performance without any expectations, 
and we would have all looked at it a lot differently. We would have said, well, you know, he, he did quite well for himself. Same performance. Um, so we'll see what happens. It's, um, it's going to be well worth watching, and especially on you know, what is a sort of a slow weekend in boxing as we're all kind of waiting for the big guns to come out here in the next month or so. Um, it's great timing. It's going to be wetting the appetite, you know, hopefully of the general fan who's looking forward to these other big fights coming up. Um, on, on, on the undercard of uh, Gonzalez and Russell Jr., I mentioned Jamel Charlo, uh, rising uh, junior middleweight, who I believe it was Jamel who was it, Jamel or Jamal, who had the title fight, who had the title fight with um, Andrade until Andrade supposedly dropped out. Was it him? Was it Jamel or the other brother, Gail? Um, you know, I need to check that out. It was, uh, let's check here. It is the, it is uh, the guy who's it fighting was, tomorrow. It was, okay. Jermel, it was Jermel who dropped out. Okay, right. Jamel fighting uh, Vanus Monterosi. Um, Jamel, very good fighter, very talented fighter, uh, tall guy, excellent boxer as far as I'm concerned. Uh, a technician in the ring is, is how I define him. Um, he's the favorite going in, but I may be wrong here, but Marlon Rosen, many look at him, uh, look at his fight with Andrade. Uh, to me, I think he's going to give Jamel Charlo a little bit tougher fight than a lot of folks expect. Uh, I go to you on this one, Gail. Your thoughts on uh, Charlo and Marta Rosen. And are you a little bit surprised that Charlo's taken on, as far as I'm concerned, such a tough bout as he's he's really on the verge of a world title shot? He should have got one last year, but a title shot for him is coming soon. Yeah, a title shot is coming for him soon. Um, I'm not... I'm not real surprised that um, he's taking this on. Um, you know, he had uh, he's 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 had. Uh, I'm looking down at this record. You know, he's had uh, three fights a year um, the last couple of years. Uh, he had uh, actually had two two in two in 2011, and then he's had three fights every year since. So if he's going to do that, you know, he needed to make a fight here between now and, you know, middle of April. So he, he needed to get in the ring. Um, and I think this is a, a good matchup for him. Um, but it won't be easy. And, you know, the, the Marta Rosie and, you know, the whole family all, all fights, all the brothers fight. This is the one that's sort of under the radar. And... Um, it's you know it was a great fight for him to take because you know Showtime has really you know been trying to bank on the both the Charlo brothers coming up and uh, you know grooming them to be in their stable of Showtime you know regular stars but it's been a little slow um, you know I I've been a little disappointed at their progress you know they've both been in as pros for eight years now. And um, I, I wish they were a little further along, but we'll see what happens this weekend. Part uh, of the problem, too, is that, you know, really, did, did, did Mom have to name both the, these guys so close together? It was ridiculous. <laughs> I did not help anybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your thoughts on this, about Addict? Yeah, um, should be a good, really good fight, actually. I'm kind of slightly favouring Matarosian. Um, I think he's got a style, with, you know, very tough guy, and I think he can possibly eke this one out. I mean, he lost a split decision to Andrade, didn't he? Um, in a sort of, well, what most people thought was a close fight. So I think he's got a little bit more coming into this one, personally. Um, he's had to sort of rebuild himself again, and... Um, this is a fight that he's got to win to get a title shot again. But um, I mean, I was I was reading an interesting column on um, Ring Magazine about it was a Demetrius Andrade interview, um, and he was sort of talking about both fighters. And from his interview, he's obviously fought Matarovian, um, and he's looking to fight Charlo. Um, but I think he seems to think that Charlo's took a fight on here, which is going to scupper that fight, the Andrade fight happening. 
in that Martirosian might well beat him. Um, so yeah, interesting to see uh, how both of them get on here. Charlo's looked really good whenever I've seen him. Um, although I do get the brothers mixed up a little bit, so I'm not sure which one I'm watching sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, looking forward to that one. But I'm slightly going with Martirosian only because of that, that column of red from Andre, really. Uh, move, I want to move on quickly. Um, shout out to Ben Umar uh, his, on his appearance on the Power for Power Box Report uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he mentioned this fighter. Uh, he mentioned Juan Francisco Estrada. Talked about him being one of his favorite fighters. Uh, he he feels that Estrada is the top flyweight in the world. Uh, I think it's Roman Gonzalez personally, but I can understand his argument as he is very good and one of the most improved fighters over the past two to three years. Uh, he's going to be fighting this weekend in Mexico against a guy by the name of Insenho, uh defending his belt. I expect Estrada to win. Uh, not just talk about the fight, Gil, but talk about Juan Francisco Estrada uh, and how your thoughts on him as a fighter in a really, as far as I'm concerned, power-packed flyweight division, particularly at the top with Estrada, uh, Roman Gonzalez, Rung Roy, who recently defeated Zal Shami. Uh, observations of, of Juan Francisco Estrada. You have to view this him. How good do you think he is? I think he's very good. I think that um, you know he's he's one of those guys. You know, we talk about this stuff all the time about the you know fly the lighter the lighter divisions in boxing and you know all this talent that's down there and getting overlooked. You know, yeah, he is. You know. Uh, you know, coming off some some rough fights, but um, you know he he he's he's the kind of fighter that he just manages to find a way to get the job done. That's that's the kind of guy there. You know, he he I think he let's go. You know, I'm going to go back to exactly what I talked about when I mentioned when we talked about Russell here a few minutes ago about being damned by expectations. You know, a guy who's really expected to do well and doesn't suffers. A guy who isn't always expected to do great things and then does, it's a it's not just a flipping it around. It is it is exponentially better for for any performer, any athlete who isn't expected to do much and rises above that. You know, figures out a way uh, you know, just to get the work done, and he's he's one of those guys. So it's not like people are looking at him with huge excitement to see him. Um, but nevertheless, he delivers. He's one he's one of those people, and you need you need performers like this in sport who are solid, who you you know for whatever reason they just don't stick in your mind um, in the same way as you know some of their competitors but they don't want to bug him they just they just keep on and he's one of those guys he's steady and he gets the job done and he yeah I think everybody is is thinking well he again no expectations huge expectations that he'll win but he he's always in it and yeah, absolutely. that's that's the most you can ask absolutely I uh, followed his loss to uh, Roman Gonzalez, 2012, around Thanksgiving Day, Thanksgiving weekend. Um, he has improved leaps and bounds. I go to you on this one, Addy. I see a lot of similarities between him and Frampton. Uh, the only difference is Frampton, he moves a little bit more. Uh, both of them are all around complete fighters who can box from the outside, who can fight on the inside, and do so with power. Uh, good, solid defense. Uh, your perception of uh, Juan Francisco Estrada, in terms of, uh, and, and where do you compare? How do you rank him um, in kind of your favorite fighters, your top fighters, or how, to the point? How do you compare him with uh, the Roman Gonzalez's and the Armand uh, Runways of the world at flyweight? Yeah, well, Estrada is one of these guys that uh, again I had to go back and sort of have a look at. So I watched the Gonzalez fight, um, and obviously going into that fight. Estrada hadn't won a title, he was just a contender really, um, and he showed in that fight that he is very tough, um, 
I'm not sure about him being the big puncher that somebody may have mentioned there. He's got a decent dig on him, but I was certainly once when he when he was in with Gonzalez, <laughs> Gonzalez certainly looked the bigger puncher, but he did fantastically well in that fight. And since then he's gone on and he's won every fight since, you know, he's beat Segura, hasn't he, and Deloria and a few others. Um so I mean, I, I thought he was really impressive in that Gonzalez fight because obviously Gonzalez is, is tough as hell, comes forward, hits you with big shots, and he, he kept finding a bit more to come back and come back. Um, so I think he's a, he's a cracking fighter, and I think he's probably, you know, certainly behind Gonzalez, possibly the best in the division there. Um, the fight that he's having... Um, uh, Obviously, tomorrow he's not fighting. A, I mean, I'm not sure where they've plucked this guy from. Actually, he's ranked 15th in the Philippines. Um, never mind on, on the world level. So, um, how this guy's got a title shot against Estrada, I've got no idea. Um, but it seems like it's just a, maybe a stay busy fight, easy voluntary or something. Um, so he'll, he'll win the fight tomorrow night, you would imagine, and hopefully we can see him go on and uh, maybe get the rematch with Chocolito down the line. Or um, I know that division's quite hot, isn't it? There'll be a few decent fights in there. And the key is about Estrada, from my perspective, he's still young. The cat, he's he's he will be 25 next month. So yeah, when you think exactly. about that, he he will only get better. He will only get better. Oh, that's a good point. You know, I think after this fight, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see him against somebody like um, uh, I'm not, uh, can't think of his last name, that uh, defeated Shu Ming. I think that, yeah, I, you know, he's he he could, that, that would be an interesting matchup. I, 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 I still say that they will fight a Valoria rematch first. I still got that sneaky suspicion. That fight will happen before a one more fight or even a Roman Gonzalez rematch, which is the fight that everybody who pays attention to the smaller guys, that's the fight that everybody wants to see. Oh, yeah. But you know what? They'll make him run the table on everybody else first before he gets that rematch. Absolutely. Let's move on. Uh, last fight of the night we will talk about as uh, Nonito Donaire, uh, who was destroyed by the Axeman Nicholas Walters, he's going to return to the ring. Uh, this Saturday uh, in the Philippines, fighting a guy by the name of Prado, Prado, excuse me, 10 round junior featherweight bout as Donaire moving back down to 122 pounds after complaining that he couldn't make the weight anymore. Shows you what a butt whooping will do for you. Um, and from what I'm hearing, he's having some, he's not, he's, he's making, he's working extra hard. Um, he's, and because of that, he's making the weight much more comfortably. Uh, I'll go to you on this, Miguel. We've talked about Nonito Donaire, and our concern, and I think I can speak for you on this one, is that we were a little bit worried that uh, whether Nonito Donaire has the desire anymore. Um, we talked about how he's comfortable, how he's happy, how he is happy, and how he has made, quite frankly, he's made a lot of money. Keep in mind, when he fought uh, Vasquez Jr., he made a million dollars for that fight. Um, he was making high six figures. I think he made a million dollars when he fought uh, Rigando as well. Uh, so he's for a junior featherweight. He has really made good money. Uh, your your thoughts on uh, Donito Donaire at this stage in his career, uh, going into this fight with Prado? Because I look at it, Prado isn't much of a, a guy. Uh, C level by B minus C level fighter at best. I think Donaire, he should have his way with this guy. Uh, but beyond that, the real question for Donito Donaire, what is, what is his mindset going in, following, well, especially following such a devastating loss? Yeah, Donaire's biggest opponent right now is himself. Completely he has got to battle his demons down. And he's decided to make it tougher for himself going down in weight class. And there is chatter that he is having trouble making the weight. He skipped the media workout earlier this week. He was a no oh, I heard he was actually not having trouble, but proceed. You, you have more Yeah, well, the, 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 the scuttlebutt is he is having trouble um, because he skipped the media workout 
um, and uh, the the chatters that um, you know he's you know be been seen chewing gum all the time, which you know a lot of people who are trying to you know keep themselves from uh, eating too much will do. And uh, now his dad, who's his trainer, Donier Senior, says no, no, he's going to make weight fine. Everything's fine. Um, that you know, it just was tough getting started at first, but now he's he's on track. Everything's going to be fine. Well, we're gonna we're gonna find out. I I he he absolutely got an ass whooping uh, by Walters. It was shocking. I was I was there for that fight, and it it surprised me. It is a shame. He is exactly the kind of guy boxing needs. He's you know one of those real star quality guys in one of these small weight classes which we always talk about super fan friendly knows how to promote himself the consensus fighter of the year in 2012 you know, two, barely three years ago really two and a half uh, amazing that now we're talking about him having this fight you know out of the spotlight come back kind of fight to see if he can reinvent himself. I, I hope he can. I hope he gets his head right. I don't think I bet all of my next paycheck on it, but I still do hope he does well for his own sake and perhaps even more for boxing's sake. And for those who don't know, uh, when she meet when Gail talks about Sway Gail, one of the old uh, tricks in order for a guy to make weight is to chew gum. Um, one, I hear that chewing gum over a long period of time to help strengthen the jaw, but more importantly, more to the point in terms of losing weight, um, the old adage is if you chew a lot of gum, um, particularly kind of a trigger warning, particularly if you spit <laughs> after you chew gum a lot, after saliva or whatever fills in your mouth, that, that helps you. One of the things that helps you, it'll help you lose weight over the long haul. Another thing is if you suck on lemon, if you start sucking on a lemon, whatever, that supposedly helps you kind of dehydrate yourself so you can make weight. So that's when Gail hears, when Gail mentions him, that rumors are that Nonito Donaire is chewing a lot of gum. That's for the main purposes. It's one of the ways to help you choose late. It also helps, reduces your appetite. So uh, go proceed at it. Your thoughts on this fight between uh, Nonito Donaire and Prado, as well as what Gail was mentioning about him having issues moving back down to 122 pounds. Yeah, um, it's a fight that Donaire is going to win. It's a hometown fight um, to get him back, sort of back up there and looking good, I suppose. Uh, this Prado guy, I've seen him before. He came over and fought Quig, and he got blasted out within sort of three rounds or something. Um, so yeah, I think Donaire will win that fight pretty easily, and it's a fight for him to get his name back up there and um, you know get a good TKO or KO on his. On his uh, resume again. Um, I think he's personally still got a bit left in him, Donair, so I think there's a good fight out there for him, uh, possibly with, um, possibly with, you know, it, it could even be a title fight with the winner of Gradovich and um, Selby or something like that, you know, uh, maybe even a fight over in Britain or something different. There's not a lot left for him to do in this sport. He's got nothing to prove. Um, he's been brilliant over the years, and like Gail was saying, you know, top quality guy in and out of the ring. So, um, you know, it's still a big fight out there for him. So hopefully, we'll get a victory tomorrow night. Um, the weight thing, I'm not sure. I mean. <laughs> I've never heard the one about sucking on a lemon, but there you go. I have. I heard it's an old, old trick that if you suck on a lemon, um, that it will help dehydrate you and get some of the extra fluid out of your system. Ah, right. Okay. There are so many old wives' tales about dieting. I mean, you get a group of women together to talk about all these crazy diet things. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna leave it, and I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I, I, we have all heard the gum one, that's for sure. It's yeah. not just boxers, but it, it's yeah. just ridiculous stuff. And, well, yeah. if you go, if you tell somebody to go and suck on a lemon over here, it's a bit of an insult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's universal, actually. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, I mean, Donaire's a good guy, isn't he? We want to see him probably do a little bit more. But if he was to, you know, retire on a sort of, 
you know, hometown win in front of his fans, then fair enough. But but he might have won last little bit in him. I mean, he was in against Walters, who is, you know, who is looking pretty damn good. And, I mean, with the weight thing, as you get older, of course, it's always more difficult. That might be a little bit to do with it. Um, but also, he seems to be a little bit sort of in between weights, doesn't he? He doesn't seem to know what he is at the moment. So, uh-huh. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I got you. No, yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say, you know, obviously with the weights, he doesn't seem to, to know which division suits him best at the moment. Maybe that's because he's he'll probably get beat by the best in each of those divisions. But, but you know, I'm, I'm happy to see him out there again and give it another try. I'd love it if he came over to Britain and, you know, if, if Selby were to win that fight, maybe try and win a title against, you know, if he were to come over here and win the title again, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, he has this, he's in a cast 22 game. That's the dilemma with Donair Claus, I'm concerned. At 126, um, he's too small. Uh, you saw what Axeman Walters did to him. Uh, when you look at, um, I don't think he beats Lomachenko at this point. Um, Gradovich, Selby, he could have beat Gradovich uh, under the right circumstances. Selby, uh, Selby's a really good boxer here, so. I'm not sure about that. Maybe uh, I think Selby can outbox him too. Um, and at 122, he's already lost to the best fighters in that division. He lost to uh, Rigando. At this point, I don't see him beating Frampton. Not the way Frampton's fighting at this point. And Quig, if Quig can get to Nodera's body, he would be in trouble there. So he's at a catch 22 in his career. Who, who at 122 or 126 scale? Who does he stand the best chance of winning world title against? I, you know, right now until I see him perform, I don't think he can do it. I hate to say that. I, I think that I think that's a tough call. You know, I'm going back and looking at his record uh, to see, you know, when the last time he was he fought at this weight. It it goes back quite a bit. So. Yeah, but and he's also older than I always think he is. He's 32. Right. He strikes, he strikes me as younger for some reason. I, I don't know why that is. He's so, a bit of a baby face. Yeah, I guess that's it. I mean, you know, these yeah. little guys, maybe that's it. Um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see if he has a really a spectacular outing and he, he calls it a, a career in the ring after this weekend. I don't – actually, I think that – if he has a really good outing, it'll be the opposite, and he'll keep going. But let's see. there's a lot of boxes he's got to check off. He's got to make weight. He's you know, got to have a good performance here. He's got to decide whether he's you know he can really stay down at that weight. What did it take him to get there? Um, because if if it was a struggle and it takes a lot out of him, um, he can't face one of the big names. He he won't have it. Is this um, fight happening? Is this fight happening at Super Bantamweight then? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. And his yeah. last Super Bantamweight fight was, and I'll tell you a second. Rick and Doe. Rick and Doe in 2013. Well, now he had a Super Bantamweight fight. Um, uh, actually, he he won the vacant title against Vasquez in early 2012. So he goes back yeah. at, at, yes. super, 2013, at super. 2013 when he fought Rick and Dylan lost. Well, that's what, yeah, that, well, that was his, right, his last fight at that weight. You're right. His early, his first fight at that weight was uh, in, 20, in 2012, yeah. So I think it, he, he bounced around, you know, he, I mean, he started it. You know, he's like all of them. He started at super flyweight, super flyweight. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you get older, you should certainly be moving up, if anything. I'm always a bit wary when people are dropping down at the end of the career. Um, yeah. Well, and that, you know, and uh, say what you will, um, you know, when you hit, when you hit that 30-year-old threshold, I mean, it is just... You know, it's practically an irreversible law of nature. Your metabolism yeah. is going to change. I don't care who you are, and it just happens. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, I think we're going to shut things down for this evening and for the <laughs> show. Uh, yeah, because right, we're, because we're all hungry there. now. <laughs> yeah, and also there's a, there's a really good bout happening right now between Curtis Prescott and a guy named Lawson, a very good bout. I want to catch the end of that. Um, Gail Falkenthal, for uh, folks who want to talk boxing and whatnot, let the folks know where they can find you. You can always find me, first of all, through my column, which is at Communities Digital News, comdiginews, C-O-M-M-D-I-G-I news.com. And when there's a fight going on, I'm generally on my Twitter handle, which is PR Pro San Diego. Um, boxing Addict, for folks who want to talk boxing or anything else, let the folks know where can get you up. Yeah, you can get me at Mr. Boxing Addict on YouTube, um, and I promise I'll, I'll get the Twitter sorted soon. <laughs> <laughs> we'll drag you in kicking and screaming, man. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. But um, I'm going to try and tune into the, the later rounds of this Prescott fight now myself. Yeah. It's yeah. dead even in there in the eighth round. Right. Uh, and, and that's the end of this evening's show. Um, on the next episode of the Pound for Pound Box Report, we will do a recap of this weekend's action. Uh, Ken O'Brook fighting Jojo Dan, Johnny Gonzalez fighting Gary Russell Jr., uh, Jim Rail Chalo fighting Vladis Monaros, and Juan Francisco is shot about, as well as Nonito Donez fighting against William Prado. We will also do a preview. Uh, we will also preview Adonis Stevenson, uh, his fight coming up against Saki Obika, Artur Bertabia fighting uh, Gabriel Campillo. Uh, and we will also talk a little bit about this thing, this new concept called Big Knockout Boxing, uh, kind of a new thing that's happening, that's been happening over the past year. Uh, part of that Big knock. Big Knockout Boxing, which will be on pay-per-view, is uh, Gary Russell's. He's going to be fighting Curtis Stevenson on that, as well as Juan Soto Carras is going to be fighting. It's kind of a new invention that's happening um, in the boxing world, so we will talk about all of those things. Um, I want to thank Gail joining us. Gail Falkenthal, Community Stadium of News, joining us live from California. The one and only Mr. Boxing Addicts, Addict joining us live from the UK, staying up for us. Uh, thank you guys for joining me. Our pleasure. Yeah, great stuff. See you next week. Absolutely. For Gail, welcome to all for Mr. Boxing Addicts. I am Michael. This has been another episode of Pound for Pound Box Report. You guys have a good evening, good night. See you next week, Gail. Let me watch the end of this fight. Yeah, no, no kidding. It's a good one. All right.